Today, I'd like to take you on a journey into the chemistry of garlic and insights into its anti-cancer activity. Right, so um, garlic has been used since ancient times in the prevention and treatment of disease. It's mentioned in the oldest known medical text, the Egyptian Ebers, dating back from 1552 BC. Here it's mentioned as a cure for 22 different ailments, including tumors. Also during the time of the bubonic plague, doctors would wear masks with cone-shaped beaks, which were filled with herbs and garlic to purify and sterilize the air to protect them from the black plague. We know today that garlic is a natural antibiotic. So garlic is indeed said to be the elixir of life. Among its many health claims are that it lowers blood pressure. It also fights infections and kills parasites. It's also said to ward off vampires. Sorry, I couldn't resist putting this one in. To boost the immune system and to provide strength and stamina. It's also claimed to protect against cancer. What about the chemistry of garlic? Well, it only comes into play actually when you process the clove. So this is the type of chemistry that you're gonna be performing in your kitchen. So the cysteine sulfoxide aline, which is um, shown over here, is found in whole, in whole garlic. Uh, when you take a knife to the garlic and you start to crush it, you enable the enzyme alinase to come into contact with aline. Um, and then an elimination reaction ensues to form two propene sulfenic acid. Two of these molecules can readily self-condense to form a molecule of allicin. And allicin is actually um, the, the um, major component of freshly crushed garlic. It's responsible for the pungent smell of garlic and it's also a natural antibiotic. So allicin is actually produced by the plant in chemical defense against pathogen invasion. So it's actually uh, produced as an anti-infective agent um, uh, um, chemically by the plant. Um, if you actually take this freshly crushed garlic preparation, um, as you would do in your kitchen, and you heat the garlic, uh, you will enable two molecules of allicin to come together through um, a, an s thiolation reaction to form this um, thiocarbocation, which can undergo um, um, a, a lim um, beta elim elimination to form this um, thiocarbocation, which can then undergo gamma addition with two propene sulfenic acid to give acoine. Um, and acoine is, um, importantly, it's uh, the, the compound of interest um, in our work, and it's cytotoxic to cancer cells. So in other words, acoine will be generated um, in, your, in your kitchen through um, the processing and cooking um, of garlic. Um, what's interesting about this acoine structure is that it has this vinyl disulfide moiety, which is seldom found in other natural products. It also has a sulfoxide group and two allyl side groups. Disulfides are common in biological systems where they're known to undergo mixed disulfide exchange reactions with biological thiols. And we were wondering if acoine might in fact be mimicking um, these processes. Um, and, um, um, and in this regard, acoine may estylate a cysteine thiol on a protein, on a target protein to form a mixed disulfide, thereby transferring this R2 group from acoine onto the protein thiol. So this would be akin to some kind of post-translational modification, uh, which would result in a number of downstream effects, which could be cell signaling, inhibition of protein function, or inhibition of enzyme activity. Um, in order to study acoine, we first of all needed a synthesis to its analogs. And at the time, uh, there was no known um, synthesis to acoine other than the, the kitchen cooking um, experiment that I'd showed you on the previous slide where you can heat up allicin. So that was the only known synthesis to acoine and there was no synthesis to its analogs. So um, we, we got together um, with Pro Professor Hunter to develop this four-step synthetic route to synthesize analogs of acoine where we could vary uh, the side groups um, at being R1 and R2. So this overall four-step synthetic route um, has an overall yield of, of 35%. And briefly, the R1 substituted thiol is first of all propargulated with propargyl bromide. This then undergoes regioselective and, and moderately stereoselective radical addition um, of thylacetic acid to give the vinyl disulfide as an EZ mixture of stereoisomers. 
Then um, thio acetate deprotection um, using methoxide at low temperature, followed by sulfenylation using the R2 substituted tosylate, gives us the vinyl disulfide in good yield. But um, the final step is a chemoselective oxidation from the sulfide to the sulfoxide um, to give our, our acherine analog. And so using the synthesis, we were able to um, come up with um, many different analogs. So these were new compounds that had never previously been synthesized, but related to acherine, um, so that we could actually study its acherine's mechanism. So uh, there were a number of analogs we synthesized with different side groups. I'm not going to put an exhaustive table over here, but just to mention to you that we, um, all of the analogs synthesized uh, retain their, their anti-cancer activity or their cytotoxicity on cancer cell lines, um, with some of them having um, improved activity, some reduced activity. But we did find that our most active analog was this one over here, uh, which we called BIS-PMB, and it was 20-fold more active um, than, than acherine. We also found that BIS-PMB had some selectivity for cancer cells over normal cells, and we tested them against um, a range of different paired um, cancer cell lines with their, their normal counterparts. So there was a margin of selectivity um, of this compound as well for cancer cells over normal cells. So having identified that the terminal side groups in acherine are not um, critical for activity, in actual fact, we can change these terminal allyl groups and actually improve the activity. We then set out to probe structure activity effects of this vinyl disulfide sulfoxide core um, in acherine, and we used this PMB as our model compound in order to do this. So first of all, when we removed the sulfoxide to the sulfide, we found that the IC50, and this was in an esophageal cancer cell line, actually went down a little bit. So this goes to show that the sulfoxide is not critical for its, its anti-cancer activity or its cytotoxicity. When we removed the vinyl group, um, you'll see that the activity, um, uh, we actually lost some activity um, and this, this was eightfold. And this seems to um, support the um, vinyl group labelizing the disulfide in thiolysis exchange. And indeed, when we actually removed the disulfide to the sulfide, uh, these analogs were inactive. So it does, um, this does seem to support our hypothesis that in fact, it's the disulfide, which is the pharmacophore in this molecule, and the vinyl group is serving to labelize the disulfide in thiolysis exchange. We further went on um, to determine that this thiolysis exchange reaction um, is actually uh, regioselective because when we incubated this PMB with NBOC protected cysteine, there was only one product that was produced. And this indicates that the sulfur in the disulfide on the right-hand side is actually the more electrophilic sulfur of the two. Um, and, and therefore this reaction is regioselective with this right-hand group, which is highlighted in red, being transferred during the thiolysis um, process. In order to um, study this, um, the, the role of the leaving group further, um, we, we decided to, to look at the role of this leaving group, which is indicated here as RS minus. So this is the, the other part of the acuine molecule, which is expelled following um, thiolysis exchange. And we decided to probe the importance um, of this leaving group um, in this reaction and in the biological activity. And to this end, um, Nashia Stellenboom um, synthesized a range of disulfide compounds um, in which the right-hand side was locked as propyl and the left-hand side had a number of different um, potential leaving groups. So different types of leaving groups and the leaving group ability can, is indicated by this pKa value over here. So in other words, the lower the pKa, the better the leaving group um, ability. And indeed, we found a really nice correlation between the log of the IC50, which is indication of the biological activity, and the pKa of the leaving group of this library of disulfides um, following a thiolysis exchange um, reaction. And so this to us um, was very interesting because first of all, it showed that um, you know, the, the activity of these compounds really is dependent on thiolysis exchange occurring within the cancer cell. Um, and secondly, that this thiolysis exchange reaction seems to be driven by the stability of this expelled leaving group. So it's also driving um, this chemical reaction. So using the knowledge that we had gained, we then decided 
um, to synthesize a useful aquamine analog and to actually insert um, a tag onto the one side um, of aquamine. And we inserted it onto the right-hand side of the aquamine molecule to ensure transfer to the protein targets during thiolysis. And in this case, we selected to put um, a Danzel label on the right-hand side because Danzel is a fluorescent group. Um, and there was also an, anti, uh, an anti-Danzel antibody, which we could obtain um, against this, this Danzel label. And so this um, synthesis um, was, was done uh, with, in the MSC project of Jonathan Cotton, and again, um, together with um, Professor Hunter. And we first of all generated the Danzel sulfenylating agent, and this was done quite routinely, starting from three amino propanol with a series of reactions that involved danzylation, mesylation, iodylation, and following, and finally tosylation. And then this um, uh, Danzel, uh, tos- Danzel sulfenylating agent was added to the vinyl thiacetate, acetate, which was generated from our aquamine synthesis, um, and involved low temperature deprotection of the enthylate followed by regioselective addition of the danzel tosylate to form um, um, the vinyl disulfide, which again was chemoselectively oxidized um, to form danzel aquine, which we called um, DP. And what was nice here is that we found that DP actually retained its anti-cancer activity um, compared to aquavine. So this is this danzel aquavine called DP against a breast cancer cell line and the esophageal one. And you can see that it's nicely retaining um, its activity. So even though we had put this large kind of functional group on the side, um, the, the compound still appeared to be active, but nicely in this case, it was now a fluorescent compound. Um, and it fluoresced at 515 nanometers, uh, which was kind of like a blue-green color. Um, also, Danzel aquavine was still able to induce apoptosis in cancer cell lines. So it appeared to be um, doing all the right things or things similar to what aquavine should be doing. Um, interestingly, we found is that when we treated, these, these were breast cancer cells, when we treated the cells with Danzel aquavine, Um, Obviously, in untreated cells, there was no protein labeling, but in treated cells, there were a number of proteins which were labeled by Danzel Aquavine, and in fact, the labeling increased over time. Um, We we were also able to see that this label was attached by a disulfide linkage, because if we added DTT um, to the the cell lysates, we were able to cleave the, the, the label off the proteins by cleaving the disulfide bond. So this is quite an interesting slide because it actually shows that aquavine or danzel aquavine have many protein targets in cancer cells. Um, and that uh, it kind of just also verifies that um, aquavine is, is s um, protein protein targets. Um, then the next thing um, was to uh, treat live uh, breast cancer cells with danzel aquavine, which is over here, and the organelles were stained with um, specific organelle uh, specific dyes. And viewed through the confocal microscope, um, cells treated with danzel aquavine were found to accumulate within the cells, and here they have this blue fluorescence. They also seem to be compartmentalized within certain locations of the cell. Using a green um, live cell tracking dye for the mitochondria, it's evident that the blue and the green fluorescence are not located within the same region and that danzel aquavine is not within the mitochondria. However, using a tracking dye for the endoplasmic reticulum shown over here, you'll see that there's a striking similarity between the red tracking dye for the ER and the blue, um, which comes from danzel aquavine. And in actual fact, an overlay of these two signals give a lovely pink overlay, uh, which demonstrates that aquavine targets and accumulates the endoplasmic reticulum um, in cancer cells. So this is the first time that we'd shown that actually uh, this compound is targeting um, the ER um, in breast cancer cells. So what happens in the ER? So it's a site where newly synthesized proteins are correctly folded and actually there's a lot of disulfide bond formation occurring um, in this region because um, as part of the um, folding of proteins, um, this involves disulfide bond formation. And in actual fact, the ER is a location which supports the formation of disulfide bonds. It's quite an oxidative environment. So it actually supports um, this disulfide, this oxidative um, reaction to occur. 
Um, and so we hypothesized that aquine might be um, estylating the ex exposed cysteine residues of, of newly synthesized proteins within the ER and thereby, therefore preventing um, its proper folding. Um, this would lead to an increase in misfolded proteins, uh, which would induce ER stress, which is known to um, induce apoptosis um, at, at high levels um, of ER stress. Um, misfolded proteins are usually toxic to cells and they are actually under normal conditions, they're ubiquitinated and sent to the proteasome for degradation. And indeed, we did see an increase in the number of ubiquitinated proteins um, in aquamine treated cells. Um, in order to prove this hypothesis, um, we decided to do um, an experiment, and this is to track um, the fate of a newly synthesized protein, type 1 collagen, uh, by following the incorporation of a tritium label into type 1 collagen over a 24-hour period, and this can be seen over here on the radiogram. So um, this is uh, the incorporation of a tritium label into newly synthesized type 1 collagen over 24 hours. Um, but treatment with um, a subtoxic concentration of aquine, we found that there was um, decreased levels um, of collagen. However, these levels were reversed. Um, whoops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, when we, uh, these levels were, were reversed when we um, treated with an, an inhibitor of the proteasome. So um, that, that seems to be sort of supporting this hypothesis because it's showing um, that aquabine is actually inducing uh, misfolded proteins, which we're not detecting because they're being sent to the proteasome for degradation. However, if we inhibit the proteasome, then we're allowing these misfolded proteins um, to build up, um, which actually, in a way, would be a nice combination therapy, I suppose, to give a proteasome inhibitor together with aquabine. <laughs> Um, so, um, okay, so this was also, uh, sorry, I've just lost, um, where I was. Yes. So we were also happy to obtain further confirmation for our hypothesis by performing, uh, this was work that was done by Voyeur and she performed a microarray using, um, esophageal cancer cells treated with the aquine analog BIS-PMB. And she found that the most significantly enriched biological processes were actually protein processing in the ER over here and the unfolded protein response. So it was quite nice to actually obtain this because it sort of confirmed what we had already discovered through empirical methods um, using our bite and aquavine uh, probe that would actually synthesize. Um, then going back and actually doing the microarray, we were able to further um, confirm um, what we'd already sort of discovered. So um, in our latest work, so this is the PhD project of Daniel Kuza, um, we, we've been looking to identify um, the protein targets of aquavine, and this has involved the synthesis of a biotinylated aquavine probe. Um, and this probe was designed um, with the aquavine pharmacophore on the left-hand side, as shown here in blue. Um, and then um, the biotin fragment is again positioned on the right hand side of the aquavine pharmacophore and separated from, from aquavine um, using a peg linker. Um, the synthesis involved synthesizing fragment A and then fragment B containing the, the biotin moiety and bringing the two together using um, a click reaction. So fragment A was synthesized um, quite routinely um, using our aquavine synthesis, where we first of all made um, the vinyl thiacetate. Um, and then um, we were able to, um, uh, upon base treatment and reaction with propar propargyl thiatosylate at low temperature, we then got um, the desired vinyl disulfide moiety, which was then um, oxidized up to give the aquavine alkyne, which was um, fragment number A. Um, to synthesize fragment number B, which was the biotin um, azide, we started off over here um, with um, this uh, PEG diamine, diamine linker, and we first of all did a monoprotection using Bach anhydride. Uh, then the remaining free amine um, over here was converted to the azide using a diazo transfer uh, reagent under basic conditions. And then the BOC group was selectively removed. So here was BOC deprotection. Um, and then 
um, the resulting A-beam was reacted with biotin N succinamide ester as the electrophilic partner to obtain um, this amide bond over here, uh, which gave us the biotin azide fragments. So those are the two click fragments which we needed to then bring together under standard click conditions um, in an aqueous solution of copper sulfate and a scorbate at slightly elevated temperatures. And here was our biotin azide um, moiety. And what's quite interesting here is that this biotin azide moiety probably looks very different from the original acoine. I mean, this is acoine, this is biotin azide. Um, but both of them have got this vinyl disulfide group, which is really um, the key pharmacophore. And you can actually see that the um, activity is sort of only slightly more than, um, well, twofold um, reduction in activity between biotin acoine and acoine. So that was also um, pleasing that even though we'd synthesized this large moiety, it still retained um, cytotoxicity. It wasn't a completely inactive analog um, of acoine. And indeed, we found that um, biotin acoine was again able to label many um, protein targets. Uh, this was again um, the breast cancer cell line. Um, and again, uh, the label could be cleaved um, following treatment with a reducing agent, um, which is seen in the last lane. Uh, and then again, this is an immunoblot, uh, but obviously with antibiotin um, antibody. So biotin acoine does appear to be um, labeling proteins, which is what we were hoping um, that it would do. Um, in addition, um, biotin acoine uh, was found to label proteins in a dose responsive manner um, in the cells. Um, and so you can see with increasing the concentrations, I suppose this should really go the other way, but if we, if we read it like Arabic where you go the other direction, um, then uh, you'll see that uh, you actually are getting increased um, uh, labeling um, as, you, as you increase the, the dose of biotin acoine. Um, this was a very important experiment because it was a competition assay between acoine and biotin acoine to show that biotin acoine and acoine share the same protein targets. And so you can see here if, um, if we treat with 40 micromolar biotin acoine, we get a nice amount of labeling. Um, and then if we keep our 40 micromolar of biotin acoine, um, but increase the concentration of acoine, uh, you'll see that you actually compete um, the biotin acoine um, off, off the protein targets um, with, with acoine. And so this is important because it's showing that biotin acoine and acoine share the same targets, and therefore biotin acoine can be used as a model compound to pull up the targets of acoine. Um, so these are the um, proteomics results that we got. Um, so the treated and the untreated lysates from five technical replicates were incubated with the stripped avidin magnetic beads. And um, thank you, a lot of this work was done with Dan in Georgia's lab. So um, thank you to Georgia, who's hosting this meeting. Um, and then they were trypsin digested to pull out the biotinylated proteins, which were identified by MassSpec. So the data shows the number of proteins detected uh, was similar across both technical replicates, um, indicating high data reproducibility. Um, it could also be seen that the streptavitin beads isolated up to ninefold more proteins from the biotin acoine treated lysate, indicating selective enrichment for the biotin acoine targets. A total of 640 proteins um, were statistically significant to the treated cells, and this is indicated on the right-hand side of the volcano plot. And these proteins are selected with high confidence and represent the biotin acoine interactome. The seven proteins, these seven little ones on the left-hand side, are those that are enriched in the untreated sample. So pleasingly, these proteins are all endogenous binders of acoine. So we pulled out the natural um, biotin binders and also some common um, contaminants of proteomics work. So based on uh, this small number of proteins which were pulled out um, in the untreated um, cells, um, we felt confident um, in, our, in the data which we had produced from our affinity um, purification. So we needed to verify um, some of these protein targets. And so it was very important for us to, to do studies um, on, on verification of them. 
Um, and this we did using the pure recombinant proteins. So one of the proteins was um, fermentin, and um, where we got the pure recombinant protein um, and incubated fermentin with um, danzel aquine, you can see that indeed the danzel label is being transferred to the protein, um, in indicative of a covalent modification. Um, and indeed, this transfer is dependent on the, the presence or absence of DTT. So DTT is, again, the reducing agent able to cleave the label off. Um, what we also did um, is um, the Danzel label was clearly seen to be covalently attached, um, yes, by, by um, this, this, dan this, this label. Um, what we also did is um, we did high resolution mass spec in order to actually try and identify uh, which of the cysteine residues um, were actually um, labeled. And what we found here is that uh, cysteine 328 was carrying a mass shift, which was equivalent to that expected um, for incorporation um, of this um, S allyl group or this danzol group um, following the modification with aquine or with danzol aquine. Um, and so, and, and these are just the predicted and the observed uh, masses uh, that we obtain. So it appears to be that um, danzel aquine is indeed s violating vermentin and that this is occurring at cysteine number um, 328. Uh, vermentin is a structural protein and a member of the intermediate filament family of proteins, and it's important in cancer progression and metastasis. What we also found is that aquine was actually affecting um, the formation of the filaments um, by vermentin. And you can see this, um, this is uh, um, uh, using um, immuno, um, uh, using antibody, the V9 antibody in um, breast cancer cells and in HeLa cells. And you can see here that the vermentin filaments have become condensed um, following treatment um, with aquine in these two different cell lines. So um, this validation experiment seems to show that indeed um, aquine is targeting vermentin. It was one of the targets we found um, and it's at cysteine um, 328 um, and that this is actually causing a functional change um, in, the, in the filaments. Um, another protein um, that we've looked at is that we found in this proteomic study was um, protein disulfide isomerase and um, this um, protein, again, um, we were able to validate that danzel aquine was able to transfer its label um, to PDI, which is seen over here um, in the treated um, recombinant protein, and that this label is cleaved off um, following addition of a reducing agent. Um, again, a uh, high resolution mass spec was able to identify the actual cysteine residues which were modified. Um, and in this case, what was really interesting is that we found modification on this fragment. So this is the untreated and this is the treated uh, bearing the CGHC, which is actually the active site um, of PDI. And you can see it contains two cysteine residues. And in actual fact, based on the, uh, the mass modification, both of these cysteine residues were modified. So and actually this, the, the mass shift of this fragment correlated to the addition of two aquine um, uh, labels. Um, uh, and we also did um, some immunostaining over here, and you can see that um, this is just using an antibody for PDI and for DP, and indeed uh, this was in an esophageal cancer cell line. You can also see that there's co-localization between the danzel aquine signal and that for protein dis disulfide isomerase using an antibody for it actually in cells as well. So. It's not just that we found this label, but there actually appears to be co-localization with the danzel aquine and the PDI protein um, in the cells. Um, the final thing was just to look at an enzyme assay. Uh, that's just the two cysteine residues that we found. I always put it here with a little star. Um, and um, this was just an enzyme assay to actually show that danzel aquine um, is actually inhibiting the enzyme activity. So we found that there was actually modification in the active site. And indeed, it's not just modifying the active site, it's actually inhibiting the enzyme. Um, because uh, this is, this is a, an assay for PDI, which is done um, based on the um, oxidative renaturation of RNAs. So um, RNAs' is, um, substrate is CCMB. And when RNAs is, is active, it's able to hydrolyze CCMP 
which has an absorbance at 296. And so you can see here, this is the signal for active RNAs. When we reduce the RNAs, it's no longer active and it no longer has this activity. However, in the presence of inactive RNAs and PDI, PDAI is able to reactivate the RNAs, uh, which then uh, kind of um, causes this activity to, to um, return. Um, in the presence of a PDI inhibitor, this is DTMB, you'll see that there's an inhibition of this activity. Um, and actually what was pleasing to see is that our danzal acobine was actually a superior inhibitor to this commercially available inhibitor at the same concentration um, for PDI. So it's not just that it's estylating in the active site um, and inhibiting the enzyme, but it's actually a very good inhibitor of the PDI enzyme. Um, then our last validation experiment um, that I would just like to share with you is we've also found that um, acobine inhibits um, COX-2 enzyme activity. So there are a lot of natural products which are known to inhibit um, COX-2. Um, and uh, acobine appears to be another of them. Um, and again, this is just doing the, the Danzal experiment to show that the recombinant protein is danzylated in a DTT-dependent manner. Again, we've identified which are the modified cysteine residues. And here it was two residues, cysteine 9 and 299. And they're actually indicated here on this uh, molecular model of COX-2. And what's interesting is that you'll see that these two uh, modified regions are actually remote from the active site. So this is the active site of COX-2. And the modified cysteines are quite remote from the active site. However, acoine is was shown to actually inhibit um, the enzyme activity of COX. And when we did um, a line weaver Berg plot, so in this case, we um, changed the concentration of the substrate, which was arachidonic acid, and measured the turnover, turnover of the enzyme, and then performed a line weaver Berg plot. And um, here we were able to find um, that acoine inhibits COX-2 um, non-competitively. Um, and so this is actually further um, evidence for what we've actually found because a non-competitive inhibitor is binding to a site that is remote from the active site. So it's inhibiting the enzyme, but remotely from the active site, which is actually does support um, you know, what we found in that the, the cysteine residues that are modified are, are remote. <clears throat> um, so just to then give an overview, um, a, a more broad overview, that was just to give some individual validations of particular targets that we've pulled out to actually validate, but an overview of um, the overall um, acoine into actome. So considering all of the acoine targets, there were a total of about 641 uh, proteins which were found, which are highlighted here um, in yellow. And what was interesting here is that 91% of these yellow highlighted proteins are actually overlapping with a database of known modifiable um, cysteines. So in other words, biotin acoine or acoine is targeting known reactive cysteines. Um, what was also interesting is that we were further able to look at what type of cysteine modification um, is, uh, is acoine going for. Um, and these types of cysteine modification events that were most associated with our acoine was those um, shown here, which is S-nitrosylation, um, S-sulfenylation, um, S-glutathionylation, um, and S-sulfhydration. So these four different um, estylation events, which take place on reactive cysteines, there are other events, but these ones seem to be the key types of events that our acoine moiety is, is going for. It's common with these types of, uh, of, of, of events. And interestingly, these modifications are strongly associated with redox sensing, signaling, and the functional regulation of proteins, which makes them ubiquitous within the human cystinome. Also for the protein targets enriched by acoine, these specific cysteine mod mod modifications are enriched relative to their presence in the proteasome. So you can see these are the these modifications and this is their percentage within the uh, proteasome. And here you can see that they are enriched um, in our biotin acoine data set. So it indicates that these redox regulatory cysteine modifications um, of nitrosylation, 
um, sulfenylation, sulfhydration, and glutathylation equate well with the electrophilicity of aquine esthylation. So this is also giving us some indication as to the types of cysteines that aquine is specifically going for. To interpret the probes interactive interactome in a broader context, we also did a few keg orthology identifiers. And this is a very general, broad type of analysis, but it did highlight that protein enrichment occurred most abundantly in biological systems relating to genetic information processing, cellular processes, and metabolism. Also, the keg analysis showed how aquine appears to target biochemical pathways that align with its reported anti-cancer activity, namely anti-proliferative, pro-apoptotic, and anti-metastatic activities. So taken together, our results reveal that biotin aquine caused widespread estylation in the MDA MB231 protease, proteome. It was found that protein estylation occurred predominantly within systems relating to metabolism, to cellular processes and to genetic information and processing. And that aquine was targeting functional and signaling pathways essential to the biology of the cancer cells. So just in summary then, um, aquine, when my daughter saw this, she sort of laughed at me, but you know, I thought I was gonna make it quite dramatic. So it unleashes its weaponry in cancer cells by covalently modifying cysteine thiols through thiolysis exchange. These covalent modifications cause changes that lead um, to enzyme inhibition, loss of function and cell signaling. Aquine has got many protein targets in cancer cells. It accumulates in the ER of cancer cells when it interferes with protein folding and causes ER stress. And widespread protein estylation was found to target functional and signaling pathways essential to the biology and survival of cancer cells. And I suppose you could say these results support the use of dietary garlic as a broad spectrum anti-cancer agent. So finally, um, I'll just, I'd like to, first of all, thank you for inviting me again, um, and also to thank all the people who've contributed to this work. Most of the work here was performed by the hardworking students who really own this data um, and have generated some really beautiful data. Um, also to my collaborators for their enthusiasm in the garlic, um, in the garlic project, um, and also to funders who in the past um, uh, have funded some of this work, and to, to you, to the audience, thank you for your attention.